Long years ago, we made a trip with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. Eight November, two thousand sixteen. कि रात्रि को बारह बजे से एक ही मिनिस्टर के लिए मेरा एक ही संदेश है कि वो राज धर्म का पालन करें। हार्डवर्क वालों की सोच क्या होती है? हार्डवर्क वालों की सोच क्या होती है? अरे ये ना पंजाब की खुशबू। and welcome to the Bhartiya Janta podcast. My name is Kimaya and I know you're wondering where your usual host Raj is. Uh, he has gone to a pro-CA rally and Aditya has unfortunately been detained in Kailasa. So here I am substituting for them. So today we are going to talk about STEM, which is science, technology, engineering and medicine and specifically Indian women in STEM. Um, in a previous episode, we have talked about Indian men in STEM and how they're all overwhelmingly right wing. And if you've not listened to that episode, please check it out. So we'll discuss today what are the political cho- choices of Indian women in STEM and what were they, what are their motivations and what are their experiences in this field. And we have two very special guests joining us, Shikha and Hartika. Hello. Welcome, Hi. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Let's start with Shikha. All right. So I, um, I have a PhD in computer science. Um, I do artificial intelligence in medicine, um, uh, medical imaging specifically. Uh, so basically identifying tumors in CAT scans, MRIs, that type of a thing. And uh, yeah, I've I've did my engineering in India. Uh, I did my PhD in the US. Um, And I'm a woman in STEM. Uh, Nice, nice. And um, Hardika, what about yourself? Um, Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I did engineering from India and and right now I'm doing a PhD in policy analysis, which is still technically my program is classified as STEM. Does not sound like it, but it is because we're very rigorous like that. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, and what about you, Kimaya? Yeah. So I am also an engineer, but not as accomplished as you guys. So I did my engineering, wasn't actually super interested in pursuing the technical field so after my engineering I worked for a couple of years in India and then did my MBA like all good engineers and now I'm working in a tech firm but actually not in a tech field so basically I have I am a fountain of knowledge of everything on or because I'm an engineer and an MBA so <laughs> cool <laughs> we're blessed by that fountain of knowledge exactly so I, I don't know, I, this is just going to be me talking about myself the whole time. Yeah, me too. I mean, I was, you know, I heard the previous episode and I was like, my experience is very different. And, but that's just what I had lived through. So Yeah, absolutely. So, so talking about like going into engineering and then pursuing your advanced degrees as well. Tell us about why you decided to pursue engineering in the first place. And what motivated you to pursue that field further, go into research? Uh, I'll start, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So actually, I was really, really interested in science all my life. Uh, I was super obsessed with it. I would read a lot. Uh, I, you know, would wait every uh, Thursday for this science and technology supplement in the Hindu and read all the articles and be like, oh, I'm going to do this when I grow up. Uh, I was super interested. Um, I think I had a lot of encouragement from home as well. Although I don't think 
my parents necessarily pushed me in that direction. I just developed it. And uh, this is what I always kind of wanted to do. Oh, nice. And how did your family, like extended family, et cetera, react when you said you wanted to do engineering and then pursue it for them? So um, extended family, I think, you know, they're happy if you do engineering. Uh, my own parents were like a little bit uh, surprised or rather, you know, my I think their dream was that I become like an IAS officer. That was a big thing. Um, mm-hmm. I think my, according to my mom, that's like the most respectable profession, you know, like a lady collector. And my dad really wanted to do IAS as well. And he, he really wanted me to try that, but I was super into science and not to say that they didn't encourage, uh, science education. In fact, like growing up, uh, we really like had a lot of extracurricular interest in science as well like we used to do projects in school as well as home Um, my dad's like a super geek type of a person and he loves like building things so we used to build small models in the house like we made a periscope uh, we made like a pinhole projector camera we made like soap at home for a science experiment and all these types of things. And, you know, it was super fun. Uh, it was de- definitely like a very open uh, sort of an environment, which I, again, I realized that not a lot of people get that sort of exposure when they're growing up. Um, I think a lot of people are like maybe asked to study, like wrote, learn and stuff. And thankfully, I didn't have that, at least when I was in school. Nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, that's great that you actually were genuinely motivated to go into engineering. Because talking about myself, and I've heard so many people say it, I just kind of did it because everyone else around me was doing it. And it seemed like a decent option. And, you know, I never I wasn't particularly interested, in, which is why I never even really pursued the sort of uh, STEM path going ahead after engineering. Uh, but but talk but let's go to you, Hardika. Like, what's your story about why you wanted to do wanted to enter this field? So we were a Times of India reading family. There <laughs> definitely no good influence by the Hindu. But I watched too much Discovery Channel. I think that was my uh, my you know at heart. Like there's a show on Discovery Channel called Extreme Engineering. Okay, and everything was about building a ski slope in a mall in Dubai, which I, you know, I I never stopped to question, like, why do you want to do that? I just thought it was the coolest shit ever. And, like, I think that engineers have, like, the sexiest jobs ever. And that uh, was definitely... It was a very masculine motivation, let me put it that way. <laughs> yeah. And that does tend to be a thing. I mean, when I was growing up, maybe because I was interested in engineering math science these types of things i did have like a very masculine environment and a lot of my friends were male and it it was a while for me to like i think discover femininity and like have more female friends and discover my feminist identity i guess yeah but that's 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 actually a good point like for me now that i think back a lot of the because my family and a lot of the Indian middle class in general thinks of like specifically engineering or and maybe medicine and a few other fields as better than at least humanities, and that's what all the men in my family did. It was somehow like I thought I would get more respect if I went into this field, um, and so like. That was like another secondary motivation apart from the fact that it seemed like a good, decent option at that time. So that makes sense. Yeah, I think for me, uh, another thing that was like a part of like the larger context for me was like, you know, yes, as a kid, I thought I wanted to be an engineer. But also, you know, my parents were doctors and uh, they had this thing like you have to pursue science, you know. Um, And I have I have an older sister and she didn't want to do science. And I saw like how she was basically bullied into sort of doing it. 
and uh, and like l- genuinely when i was in 10th i had this like mental calculation in my head ki beta डॉक्टर बन गए ना देखो बनना तो करना तो साइंस ही यू हैव टू डू साइंस बट इफ यू बिकम अ डॉक्टर तो बाप के गले पे जिंदगी निकल जाएगी सो <laughs> <laughs> so, ये नहीं करना है तो एक ही ऑप्शन है चुपचाप इंजीनियरिंग करना एंड थैंकफुली इट काइंड ऑफ यू नो वेंट विद माय इंटरेस्ट सो इट यू नो थिंग्स वर्क आउट बट इट कुड हैव गॉन साउथ वेरी इजीली दैट्स ट्रू It's true. And talk about like your journey coming to the US now. Like, what led you here, and specifically like the fields that you are working in. Um, hard to say. You can start. So I've actually had a bit of a circuitous um, route. Um, so after getting out of uh, you know engineering, I you know I had all my friends sort of going into your. Uh, you know consulting firms or whatever i somehow did not i still had this romantic notion that no do i came here to become you know an engineer so i actually went and i got a job in like heavy engineering i was building ships in calcutta for two years and then the shipyard i was working for went bankrupt <laughs> um but uh, so i mean i don't know like uh, So after that, I actually went to uh, the Young India Fellowship, uh, and that was a great sort of experience. Uh, it you know, I had this one um, professor who came and uh, taught us anthropology. Her name is uh, Mekla Krishnamurthy, and I was talking to her about you know my life choices and what I want to do in the future. And I kept telling her, you know, I'm an engineer. You know, that's that was like a huge part of my identity. And she was like, "Yeah, it's a qualification. That's something you can do, but that's not the only thing you can do." And it like hit me, like <laughs> squarely in the middle of my chest. Like, fuck, that is so true. Um, so after that, I went and I worked for three years um, with a nonprofit, and uh, they did like you know social housing and sustainable architecture. So some part of it. you know so a lot of it was like actually like program implementation so it was a very managerial role but uh, you know it was you know it was kind of like it had that start of vibe so everybody did everything and so i made drawings also and i assigned like payment receipts also and you know so it if there was like you know a part of my engineering brain was still being used um so i did that for almost 3 years and then it was like by the end of it though i had full burnout i was like not i'm like this is not sustainable um and then i went to upen uh and you know i did a masters in public administration because i was like dude there has to be a better way of doing this i am going to learn it and then uh there i kind of you know met people who were also like you know interested in public service and all of that but i also realized that they were all like genuinely scared of maths and statistics and like programming and you know shit like that and i was like ah oh, this is like in my wheelhouse you know and uh, that's how i sort of got the motivation to do a, a phd in policy analysis oh nice nice what about yeah. shikha uh so for me um i think i so i went to a pretty uh like a private engineering college in andhra pradesh now telangana i guess uh, and uh i think you know even though i started out with very romantic notions of science the more i got into the engineering world and uh learned it within the system that is that it was in india i i think i started getting uh, more and more dis- disillusioned with the whole thing i i had no interest in what they were teaching in college it just seemed like boring and not what i had imagined it to be and uh, i wasn't i was actually kind of flailing i wasn't sure what to do and i got a job at a startup in bangalore and i worked there for a year and i was like yaar i'm just not this is not what i want uh this is not what i want to do engineer like software engineering coding day in and day out it i was not enjoying it so i sat and i like thought a little bit about what are the aspects of it that i truly enjoyed and uh 
I did enjoy research still. Like every time I did a project in college, uh, I really enjoyed that. Like developing a research model, thinking about a problem, how to solve it, those types of things. So I said, "Chalo, I'll, I'll go to the US. I'll I'll give it a try." I was thinking a little bit between PhD and masters, but uh, I ended up coming to do my masters first, and at, at, uh, during my masters, I, I got a, lot, a little bit of uh, research experience. I worked at a children's hospital, um, and I was an RA for a professor there, and I, I loved it. I, I really loved it. And, like it was everything. All of my romantic notions of science just came back to me, and I'm like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Then I applied for. Uh, uh, PhD programs, um, and I I did my PhD at Vanderbilt, uh, which is like an awesome environment for engineering and medical collaborations. So, it, it was simply like an amazing environment. Uh, I did computer science, uh, but it was mostly medical applications. So. Uh, we got a lot of like hands-on experience in how things work in the medical world, and you know, I was working with some of the best people in the field. It was really exciting, and I enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, and that's where I am now. That's also what my, I do in my job currently. Nice, nice. I feel like that's fascinating. Yeah, I feel like now I have an inferiority complex. Like you guys are so accomplished, but I have an MBA, so I never admitted publicly. But yeah still <laughs> yeah so like talking about talking about like now that you're here and now that you've studied so much etc and talking about families like a lot of indian families get antsy when like their daughters or generally women get too accomplished because of the whole marriage like who will marry you etc etc especially as you get into like your late 20s early 30s sort of situation so how has totally. that experience been for you all? Um, let's start with Shikha. Uh, it was definitely that was there. And I think in a way, I, I was a little bit naive because because my parents were so encouraging of me when I was a kid. And I thought, oh, they're not going to have a problem with this. But I think it was all fine and dandy until I was in my early 20s. And I, I, I had decided to do my PhD when I was around, I think, 25, 26, something like that. And um, my mom was really upset. She was like, if you start studying now, it's going to take five years. And then when will you marry? You won't find any guys. You're going to be like an old auntie, <laughs> you know, like, yes, why can't you just get a job? We should have never sent you to America. All this, you know, like it was. <laughs> oh my god! It was. It was. A, it was a lot. And uh, my dad didn't say much, but I. I mean, he. He was always like, "Do what you want to do," type of a person. But yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of uh, pushback when I wanted to do my PhD. And honest, to be honest, I also like because of how much pressure there was I was second guessing myself a lot yeah um and it was it, I was like oh shit yeah maybe this is right like if I do this then I just have to say bye bye to my social life but uh I think for me really I think the turning point uh, was I went to a, a woman in computing conference when I was doing my master's and that was really like an eye opener for me because, you know, as I said earlier, I was in a very masculine environment. Yeah. So even though you're doing STEM, you're never thinking about being a woman in STEM. And going to this conference was the first time where I was actually thinking about what are the unique issues that affect women in STEM. And, and there I met people from all over the world. And everyone at some point did have this dilemma in their life i mean women yeah. uh that what about marriage what about children like can we do both of them together and they found a way to do it and and they were like amazing inspirational women professors just like you know being surrounded by them and it, it was 
truly maybe I think one of the most uh, motivating experiences in my life to to decide that okay I am going to do my PhD and that's it and it I don't care what anyone else says about it nice that's amazing but it's yeah I like I'm identifying so much with what you said right now because like the same exact things that your parents said mine said you should never have sent you to the US blah 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 I would you so like I'm like majorly identifying uh but yeah hardika what about you how, how was your family so i actually don't i don't talk to my father uh so that was like one one thing less i had to worry about um but with i think with my mom you know she's you know she's a surgeon herself so i think initially even though she didn't understand it she like especially when i was at yf she didn't understand what that was about but she supported it she was like oh it's like you know education um so that was fine and then uh, i think she started getting worried when i sort of started working with a nonprofit but she was like wait so you going to just throw away your engineering degree and uh, i i don't know i've never quite had had like a like I didn't have like a proper conversation with her about it but uh, I think hers it, her problem was not that I was work and you know her problem was that I'm not using my engineering degree as opposed to you know not getting married sort of um in like in the background I've had a boyfriend like the same one for 12 years now so she's she had met him <clears throat> and she sort of knew okay ha theek hai yahi hai um you know so it was chill until i applied for my phd and i got in that was when and i was you know similar age i was i don't know i was almost 29 when i applied and uh, so she sort of flipped at that point and so for me it was like very weird because that was the first time when she was like wait it's going to take you 10 years to graduate i sent you there i mean I, she's like in her words i sent you to the us so that you could be with your boyfriend this is not what i sent you <laughs> how was it <laughs> holy shit i lost it i was just like wow <laughs> you know and then i had this like really bad sort of episode on facebook because uh, i kind of just like put this like really angsty uh, post uh, which was like um, you know you have why can't your family be happy about you or some shit like that and then um, my my roommate uh, uh, my, some uh, like a former roommate was like a very good friend of mine she was like what happened and i didn't think about it and i said like mom said this publicly okay and oh my god it blew up into such a thing like my uncle like my mom's cousin some like random uncle i haven't met in a decade is like messaging me saying you shouldn't say things like that about your mother publicly you know and i'm just like thanks for not even asking me what happened like you <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah But like, so, no, yeah, no, no. you just don't <laughs> say anything. Okay. Yeah, you gotta love Your Indian parents. extended families. They're just like, I'm going to give my opinion on this subject hmm. regardless of everything, basically. But yeah, yeah, and and I I think even for the most progressive families, I just feel like there are limits to how progressive they can be. You know, there always is like a line where after you cross it, they're like. how can you do this Absolutely. you know you know this is, is this what we've taught you and i was like yeah this is what you taught me you know you taught me to be independent you taught me to be like you know a scientist like be on your own you know do what you want to do and when we behave that way they're like surprised and they're like what are you doing you know you you need to know your limits and that's interesting i i don't think i understand why that is but it seems to be the case for almost any indian woman i meet yeah yeah and absolutely and it's almost like they expect you to sort of be grateful that they gave you all that independence and like 
yeah. why can't you do this one thing like get married or you know not do phd that i'm telling you like i let you do so much so yeah that's definitely a thing but moving on to like your growing up years i know both of you were very very interested in science and research in general but one of the sort of criticisms of the indian middle class and those who sort of pressure their children to especially go into stem etc is there's not a lot of exposure to humanities or arts or any other sort of field so tell us about like when you were a kid or maybe in college like were you exposed to different sorts of people or books etc and how did that sort of happen for you guys um we can start with hardika um okay so i think um, one thing that i'm very grateful for with my parents was that at least my mom always encouraged me to read a lot and of course it was like very like whitewashed um like i read a fuck ton of emil blyton which um is is like problematic in all the different ways but at least i started reading you know so i started reading early that i am you know you cannot uh underestimate the value of that uh and uh, yes you write that you know in engineering school i didn't like you know w- was not exposed to a lot of any humanities pretty much uh but uh, you know after that when i went to yf uh was when it was like you know we were being taught by andre bete or you know it was like just this phenomenal sort of range of people coming and talking to you and granted they were like you know really short sort of interactions but at least it gave you that humbleness of like shit i don't know shit you know <laughs> so at least yeah at least that intellectual curiosity uh was definitely um ignited nice so what about you shika uh so uh again i think um my parents did encourage me to read a lot um and my my dad's a social scientist so i always had that exposure um in fact i actually think maybe even though he tried to push some of these things onto me a little bit like he was like why don't you read history you should know this you should know that and i just was like name of the science kid man and <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know he was very like gk and every it, during summer holidays uh my sister and i we were told to learn all the world capitals like all these types of things like it was very important for them that we are well rounded and we know everything and we are well read and i think again that's it's a little bit unique um but but my dad's an academic i mean i should have mentioned that he has a phd so he kind of wanted that from us and i i once i mean we we had art classes like i went to music um my sister paints she's she's an excellent artist um so yeah we we had a pretty good childhood like i really don't have anything to complain about really yeah um and i and i realized like you know i'm lucky and i i just i don't want to come off as uh, ananya pande who like <laughs> <laughs> my childhood was i i understand that it's you know it's privilege right i mean i i my parents had good jobs they had good education uh they're upper caste and they could give us opportunities that a lot of kids unfortunately don't have and I, i'm very thankful yeah. for that but i mean your dad didn't go to coffee with karan so you are under the age i yeah i'm sorry but la like, yeah i mean like definitely like when you're an indian woman and you come like you sort of come to this stage of your life you start realizing how much privilege you have definitely and that's like also happened to me as and when i've gotten older and older like to be a woman and have a supportive family and who sort of mostly encourages you is is you have to be really really lucky in yeah absolutely 
I just don't even foresee it happening any other way for me, yes. like for the kind of person that I am. Um, and, you know, even a lot of my friends who are in STEM, they've had remarkably supportive parents at some level. If, you know, because I also do have friends who uh, I went to school with who are brilliant, uh, who, who are extremely intelligent, but who kind of got pushed into this, you know, just get married, have children. Um, we are going to spend money on our son's education and our daughter's marriage. Like this was, I mean, especially like in uh, Hyderabad, it, it, it was a big thing. I mean, people were in general not very progressive. Um, I've seen this happen to a, way too many friends of mine and it's heartbreaking. I've, I've seen it happen to family members where brilliant, brilliant women had to give up their careers, couldn't pursue what they wanted to do. Um, also didn't have, I think even being stubborn yeah. and telling your parents that, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. Even that sometimes is not a choice for people. The amount of emotional blackmail. Absolutely that go yeah it just makes it impossible yeah it's all of the conditioning like, you don't even realize it even like even if you're a feminist you don't realize how much conditioning you yeah absolutely yeah. and what about you Kimaya yeah so um, for me uh, like again my family was pretty similar to both of yours in the sense that there was always um, a culture of reading um, so I got exposed to a lot of different literature um, and in a lot of different languages as well. So I'm Maharashtrian, so Marathi literature, um, Hindi literature, English, of course. So that was definitely uh, a, a great thing which developed my knowledge in a lot of different fields. And obviously, I didn't really make a ton of use of it. I ultimately went into engineering only without a ton of thought. But now, at this age, I sort of realized that it was a great sort of foundation of you know, just having more overall knowledge in general of the, how the world works, which a lot of people don't have. So that's great. Uh, but let's take a short break and we we'll come back and talk about your experiences in STEM. Welcome back, everyone. So we have Shikha and Hardika with us and we're talking about women in STEM. So let's move on to talking about your experiences in STEM. Uh, you both went to engineering college in India. Tell us a little bit, I mean, Indian engineering colleges are famous for being dom male dominated. And I mean, we've all heard stories of the sexism and everything out there. Um, so how, how, what was your experience studying in an engineering college? Um, um, honestly, it was like living your life in a under a microscope because you were like you could not just be any t all the time like somebody is watching you, and you know it was very very uncomfortable to be absolutely honest. And I was like. Like, I remember, like, you know, all these, like, gender stereotypes about, like, oh, like, women gossip, like, oh, my God, how much men gossip. <laughs> it is not even funny. Absolutely. Like, anything you do, somebody will talk about it while you're walking by. And it was just, and, you know, I just, I just happen to be one of those people who are, like, you know, more active in, like, through organizations and everything. So, you know, a little bit more visible than everybody else. So, and those were the days when Orkut was a thing and it was like, you know, on the walls of, it was just like everywhere. Oh my God. And like, even yeah, though- Yeah, heard about Orkut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Parts of my life I do not want to revisit. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, yeah, they would like break so my back. down. Yeah. yeah, and this is like I don't know. This should probably be beeped out, but they would like break down my name as like hard dick ka <laughs> and things like that. And I'm just being like, what? Like, can you like, oh, please? And yeah, it was, it was, it was like even though we all cleared like the same exam and got there, it just they still behaved like you know I had no right to be there, mm -hmm. and that. 
yeah you like you if you're getting like good marks it's basically because you're sleeping with a prof like there can't be no other explanation whatsoever like right. of course right. you know yeah i mean it's like any woman who is like loud confident intelligent did not take fools the tarts of a fools was just like the ultimate bitch you know and so yeah it was very hard and uh, and it was very uh, it was a very hyper competitive environment so you just had to be a bro if you ever wanted like any friends in life yeah and so i sort of internalized that you know and uh, and i was like i totally owned that like yes i will scar you for life that is my mission in life you know like <laughs> 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 Yeah, I've done I I've, I've done that like I'd be just intentionally offensive. That's <laughs> amazing. Did you go to an IIT Hardika? I went I went to Kharagpur. Oh nice, nice. But like that's amazing that you like were this badass even at like 18, 19 because like at that age you usually want like social acceptance like it's hard for women in a male dominated space to like speak out etc especially when there's an environment of so much like harassment basically like how did your female friends etc react to all of that I I think there was like only two ways of reacting okay and I would not say what I was doing was super brave I think it was also in a way like uh, trying to get acceptance because you know I preface this with saying you had to be a bro like being a bro is like you know like becoming toxically masculine is not like a particularly brave thing to do and I definitely did that and <clears throat> it scarred people or like it it astonished people because it to like you know to to hear like swear words like really choice swear words from coming from a woman is like it does scar people and uh, yes i was like sort of uh, you know notorious in that sense uh, but uh, it, it was not like the bravest thing to do to be absolutely honest um yeah so i think with but i don't know there was only like two ways either there were like people who would only like you know talk to the two girls in their class you know um i didn't even have that choice i was the only girl in my class i didn't even have a senior in the cohort above me like oh my yeah. it was uh, a, it was a lonely existence what about the uh, hostels and stuff so i had yeah of course in the hostel i had uh, girls uh, but uh, i don't know like that was also like this weird form of like uh, um I I don't know there was there was like all I I can't explain it it was mm-hmm. like a, a deep distrust of boys I mean, and I'm I'm sure a lot of it was very legitimate because right. you know they've had experiences uh, where they've been harassed or whatever um so yeah it was like <clears throat> um Yeah it was a very very weird toxic environment to sort of grow into it was like you know like i said very very hyper competitive and so uh, you know i ended up becoming a a very cruel person i will say that i and i, and I took, it took me years to unlearn that you know i understand that i i was i was thinking about these things a little bit before we started recording and that is exactly what i thought of myself too i was i was cruel uh i was i don't think i was a feminist i will say that um just having so many guy friends around you and you become a bro with them and even if i felt uncomfortable with what they were saying and doing sometimes i just went along with it because you want to be the cool chick you know you want to show that you're not like Uh, other people and it, it was it was toxic it, it was definitely not ideal i i had to grow up uh, a lot you know I, i had to i think it took a few experiences for me to sit up and realize like this is not okay like if this guy says something even about a a different girl who's not in the room you can't just let him talk this way you can't laugh you know just to be cool Uh, and it it was it was not 
it was weird like it it was really weird I, when i think back to it i feel a deep sense of embarrassment shame guilt it was uh yeah kind of weird no but i mean i totally get that like in these hyper masculine environments like i remember reading an old like harvard business review article where basically it it said that women have to be in one of four categories if they work in a like a male environment one was like ice queen which is basically you're just like don't talk to anyone and be aloof one is like one of the guys where basically you you just behave like a man mm-hmm. one was just like uh i don't remember the other two but one one was i think more like you just uh be very very feminine and just be sort of like uh like a sisterish type of figure mm-hmm. uh, type of figure and one i don't remember but like i totally get that but and yeah. yeah sorry sorry go ahead no 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 go ahead no i was just saying that even like hanging out with boys right it's it's a, such a toxic thing like like hardika said it, it's like you're under a microscope there's so many there were so many rumors about me in college like so much about your sex life speculation about what's going on there was one extremely extremely strange rumor that i was a coke dealer i don't know oh why <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. i don't know there was just this thinky if this girl is this bold then she must be selling cocaine also like this was the kind of extensions that they made to your personality just because you're bold just because you swear or just because you have a guy friend and yeah. it was very hard to like wade through all of that and i don't know it and sometimes even like your guy friends um i think actually a lot of them cr- definitely cross the line they don't understand uh where the limit is so yeah absolutely and uh, do you do you guys have like friends male friends from engineering college now or like have you found that they've changed become more mature or is it the same so oh, definitely the friends i've retained i have mature like otherwise you have no space in my life <laughs> yeah great philosophy yeah yeah i think the same thing i i am in touch with a few people but um most people have have definitely cut them out of my life <laughs> 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 Um, so like after you graduated from engineering and started working and then come came to the US how has your experience been then especially working in the US in contrast to India is it obviously it won't be as blatantly sexist but there's obviously there's ample proof that stem in the US is pretty uh, discriminatory in terms of gender and race and things like that uh, so how has it been for you all uh, let's start with shikha i uh actually f- had uh really bad experiences in the US as well mm-hmm. um i i i mean again i went to college in the south uh, vanderbilt is uh, it's a pretty big university in the in the yeah. south so maybe there's a little bit of a culture change i i'm not sure what but there were definitely a lot of like chad type bros <laughs> and uh yeah that i mean it was it was sexist uh, for sure it, and they were pretty openly sexist sometimes like uh, there was this one guy um that i worked with and he he was super into puzzles and he used to uh, like solve the rubik's cube in 2 seconds i mean not 2 sec 2 minutes all you know yeah. this type of a thing uh and uh, he had a 2 year old daughter and i was like hey you you should you know teach her these things when she's a kid so she's going to pick it up and he just turned to me and he was like oh no thank you i want her to have a boyfriend at some time and what? i'm like this is so sexist you're literally oh talking about your 2 year old daughter's sex life and you're saying that she cannot be a geek or she won't find a boy <sighs> i'm so sorry for that girl I'm going to go rescue her right exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> I could not believe it. And this guy like grew up in New Hampshire. I mean, uh, he he grew really up really like blue, I guess, right? It it uh, it's a swing state actually. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, engineering college experience. Sorry, I forgot to like mention mine. And yeah. it's like pretty different from a lot of people because I went to an all women's engineering college. Wow. And yeah, that it sounds was, like the Amazonia quarter. <laughs> 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 Emily Wonder <laughs> Woman will come out of it. <laughs> yeah, but it was you know when when I got admission, I was sad. Because obviously I was like, oh, there's no boys. It'll be like so boring, blah, blah, blah. Like how an 18 year old thinks. <laughs> But after I graduated and as I grew older, I'm like so grateful for that experiences. Experience like, A, there was no toxicity. There was no like, you know, all of this terrible harassment, etc. Or And also like the great part of studying in a women's college is that all of the leadership, everything, roles are played by women. So, and there's no like inhibition about it. Like you can go go on a stage and speak whatever. You can shout. You can dance freely. You can like wear shorts. Uh, and there's like no judgment. I mean, obviously, even in women, there is judgment uh, within judgment, and that's a whole other topic. But it's definitely, definitely like better than being in a male-dominated engineering college. And I'm like, so, so I will, I will attest to that. I went to my, in my middle school, I went to an all girls boarding school. And I think I am as loud as I am because I've, you know, as a teenager, I had the freedom to shout and wear shorts and do everything I wanted. Uh, so yeah, that is, I, and I understand like we were, you know, teenagers obsessed with boys as any other, but still we didn't have like these weird hangups. Like we would play Kabaddi and tear each other's clothes and shit, you know. <laughs> wow, sounds interesting. I've never, <laughs> never been in an all girls environment. Yeah, I mean, there's also a lot of craziness that comes with it because like obviously you're young and stupid and there's ingrained patriarchy there also. Like we used to judge other girls in our college on how they dressed and stuff like that. So that, stuff is always there but still like it, it it helps like cut out a lot of like all of this toxicity from your life which is amazing so, but, so while yeah. we're on the topic of like boys and you know i just i'm curious like do you guys think that it's easy to form romantic relationships because both of you are very smart very accomplished very mm-hmm. educated um when when you date do you, you find that men find it intimidating how how does it affect your dating life yeah i mean men definitely find it intimidating like i have a lot of opinions about everything about like politics everything in general and i don't think they expect it like i've been like whenever i'm on a date and especially with an indian guy they and I, if like the topic comes to politics etc they're always surprised that I know anything and then they they're like definitely yeah definitely intimidated like even men in my like friend circle or like family are like oh my god why does she have so like why can't you just like not talk so much or be quiet or, you know but <laughs> that is that is like uh, definitely there and as soon as you and the other thing is that like I have a grad degree you guys have a PhD so Men also get intimidated if you're like more educated than them, like in forming romantic relationships, etc. Like definitely that's a thing. Yeah. So yeah. I haven't actually dated dated in a really long time, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah. just today morning I was conveyed this experience. Uh, this friend of mine she dumped a guy, and in in reporting that she told me there's only so much I can dilute my intellectual capacity for my pussy. <laughs> so I think. Yeah. Let's put that on a piece. <laughs> Yeah, I could, I could, you know, when she said that, I'm like, I am, you know what, I am recording this podcast today, I am going to quote it, and then this is just, yeah, this is, every woman needs to hear this, every yeah. woman, yeah, is, yeah your yes. pussy needs happiness, and there's <laughs> machines out there for it, uh, but like self-respect, you know, you know, yeah. I mean, and and definitely, like, I've had experiences, even in, in long-term, previous long-term relationships, that they were definitely intimidated uh, by uh, the things that I did sometimes. And in fact, I think with my ex, I remember once, uh, 
so my mom told me that don't tell him how much you make because he's going to feel like lo- lesser than you and i'm like are you serious you know like, this is just yeah i mean and and the thing is she was right she wasn't wrong so yeah. so uh-huh. it happens yeah i mean it, it like it it was yeah I've yeah, I you know I think my experiences have been more that not that you know that kind of insecurity but uh, you know the whole like like they don't step up for you like for example uh with the summer my boyfriend's parents were visiting and I went to see them too and his mom just like casually started telling me what oh, put the tea here I put the fish here and I'm just like why are you telling me all of this i i don't live here like i'm not responsible for what goes there in his kitchen and uh you know if i tell my boyfriend this he will like he'll throw a tantrum at his mom about it and then she'll come and tell me like oh no no this was not like you know she will like overcompensate yeah. but i'm just like no i want you to just like like step up for me in like normal volume and just like push back every day every small act i need you to like you know just step up and like i will take care of that you know just just like don't be like don't scream at your mom and then she will come and apologize like don't make a fucking drama out of it you know mm-hmm. and and so that that is something that i sort of um or just like right now my, my you know my boyfriend's also doing a phd and he's going through a rough patch and like you know his mom will and anytime she talks to me she'll be like if you were there you would have taken care of him it would have been so much nicer and i'm just like no but i'm also in a phd program and it yeah. is equally stressful for me like i am not his mom you know like <laughs> Uh, it's just and he, and when he like if she does this in his presence she never like steps up uh, like he never is go- he never goes like well it's it's you know even if they're like not sexist outright in the way that you mentioned where they feel lesser because you make more or whatever even if it's not that they still like you know will not use their privilege to sort of support you I think that's an excellent point and you know if we maybe this is like a good point to get into why uh men seem to be more right wing or rather okay with the status quo than than women especially in stem is is like you know women we we have to stand up for ourselves we have to sometimes get up and say ki this is wrong you know or i'm not going to make the tea or i i want to do my phd or yeah you, what, whatever it is like you have to question the things that people are telling you but men never have to you know that the society already works for them fine like they the the patriarchy works for you they you know you get what you want you're the raja bachcha you know you yeah. get everything that you need and you have all the opportunities that you need so why would they even question the status quo it's, it's working perfectly for them yeah i and i and i i suspect that that's one of the big reasons why you know maybe women tend to be more liberal because we, we have to be forced to question the values that we're taught yeah and like there's these recent nrcca protests going on all over india and you can definitely see so many women being vocal being leaders etc and that could be one of the reasons probably is that as a woman even if you're privileged you have to sort of fight for many things you see unfairness in life and so you f- you fight for other people who are experiencing it definitely i think my my experience has been that um, It, you can't tell you know like yes men you know <clears throat> your point stands that you know because it, men have more privilege it works for them so they they tend they it is in their interest to be conservative but with women i, I don't know like i have seen that in the face of uh, this they uh, i think it's a coin toss between yeah. whether they will go full right wing because then they are you know held up and given privilege in that sense Yeah. um <clears throat> or 
or you go like the op- the opposite direction where you like resisting becoming a feminist and like my own sister uh, like you know, ha- is like such an interesting example for me like my mom you know there's all these like uh, taboos around menstruation and stuff right so mm-hmm. my mom um never practiced any of that um uh, like of my grandmom did okay so in my f- family me and my sister I don't give a shit. Uh, but like my mom was like, "It's a thing. If Bhagwan's room me mat jana, that's it. Like there is nothing else. You can do whatever the whatever else you want." My grandmother would be like, "You cannot touch where the pani ka, you know, matka is, and you cannot like go inside the kitchen. Somebody will give you food. If you want to water, also you have to ask." Okay. Yeah. So it was like full and un- you were treated like an untouchable. Um. So like coming from that experience, my mom decided to like you know. be a little bit more feminist and my sister on the other hand went all the way back like when she was living with her husband it was just her and her husband in the house and her husband doesn't give a shit and she was still like she would not go into the kitchen she will do it herself and i was just like what is wrong <laughs> with you you yeah. know and i don't understand like you know i feel like it is definitely a coin toss Yeah and I I feel like there's diff- you like white women voted overwhelmingly for Trump upper caste women still support like many of them support the BJP so I guess there's also this theory that like the white or the upper caste identity gives you a lot of privileges so, so a lot of women from those sort of classes don't necessarily stand up for underprivileged women and often exploit them also No, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely you both are absolutely right that uh so for for people whom the system is working already, uh, you know, if say I'm uh someone who who just wants to get married and have children, if, for me I have there is no social currency at all in being feminist. You know, I yeah. it I would I would actually work out in my favor if I fell in line. and did exactly what my parents told me and got a husband so if that is what i want that is what i'll do i'm talking more about when the status quo is not working for you right like you so yes. you want to do a phd or you want to do an mba or you want to be an astronaut or you know you, you want to do something that is not immediately available to you within the social structures that you're living in that's when you are somewhat put in this position where you're forced to think about wait a minute why is this like why are our values this way and push back and question them that that's that's all i'm saying and yeah. it, it's not to say that all women are liberal but i think more women have been put in a position where they have to question the status that's that's all absolutely. i'm saying absolutely and compared to male counterparts they're definitely more liberal Um, but talking about politics in general um i would love to know like how did you guys discover your own politics um how like growing up did you sort of read about it know about current affairs and also how you discovered your own feminism in general uh, so yeah start let's start with you hardika um so by first I got my first politics, you know, from my parents and from Times of India, which uh, at least back in the day was not like very in your face, right wing. They were like economically were neoliberal, um, but uh, Wait, you're from Gujarat, right, Hardika? Yes, I grew up in Gujarat. Uh, oh, nice. And uh, were you like swayed by the Modi way, like Gujarat model, whatever, whatever? So Is I will say that uh, I, I, the, the, the blot I carry. is that the only time i voted in my life as a 19 year old i voted uh, for narendra modi but that was his first term it was not like after 2002 so, so uh, and and th- then i was not voting for narendra modi i was voting for bjp because i was very excited for voting you know i asked my um, my you know um, fam- uh, parents and you know they said that congress कुछ नहीं करती है ठीक है बीजेपी वाले खाते हैं पर काम करते हैं 
and to me that made sense like fine at least if they're doing something let's vote for them you know so i was uh, uh, so th- that was that and uh, i think through undergrad i was definitely like not conscious of my politics at all i don't like using the word a political i think that there is no such thing as being a political i was not conscious of my politics for sure um but yeah i think generally i used to but still like you know, i remember like reading things like down to earth because it was you know a science and environment uh, magazine and uh, and in that you know they talked a lot about like the forest rights act and i was like at least aware that you know the uh, like the tribal you know people have problems asserting their rights and you know there's in- injustice generally um <laughs> so so while i pro- you know did not go out and protest when i was in undergrad i at least like understood those facts um and uh, and when uh 2000 and and also i will say that growing up um i knew enough uh you know uh i i don't think i knew enough dalits i don't think i still know enough dalits but i at least knew enough muslims um and some of my closest friends um have been that and and so i i i you know i do understand uh, like i did understand even back then uh the kind of margin i marginalization they felt like for example a very specific example after graduation when i moved to calcutta for my first job uh the friend who was helping me look for a house was muslim and he was like you know i shouldn't go and talk to them you should go and talk to the landlord saying you want to live there you know yeah. and so yeah. so it was like you know it was things like that where, which like at least you know even though i was not like active politically I, like i understood that this is wrong <laughs> um but interestingly enough i didn't understand how sanghi my family was okay and that i only understood like in 2014 like after 2014 um so that was a very interesting sort of uh, uh, transition for me yeah like uh, my story is like extremely similar like my family had always just voted bjp and similar reasoning they were like they're just better than congress they are at least doing something so so yeah i just until i until i went to college i just sort of blindly supported the bjp um actually until i started working after college and it was only when they did demon it like i voted for modi in 2014 which is i'm not proud of but i did but and then i only sort of started actually opposing them when they did demonetization because like if nothing else at least i applied a little bit of logic <laughs> to understand that demonetization was objectively a disaster mm-hmm. and many like my even like many people in my family <coughs> i saw them suffer and go through like that whole thing so that's when i changed but that was when i was like 20 to 23 but yeah so like i was i used to be a bug before them which is i'm not proud of it but yeah <laughs> that was me So anyway what about you Shikha? Uh well I I think maybe you guys got a clue when I said my family used to read the Hindu. Um mm-hmm. uh I so my my mom is is like very there's no app in AP in Telangana yeah. but if there was she would be like an app voter you know she is like a very upright middle class values that sort of a woman she's very fair but i wouldn't say she is necessarily ideologically driven yeah uh my dad it is definitely uh very left leaning um i don't think either of my parents ever supported bjp nice. um i mean also like it's it's not that common in the south anyway it's it's not yeah. some sort of a unique uh situation in 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 south there are a lot of regional parties and uh funnily enough like my we we did talk about political issues <coughs> but uh 
we my my parents never told me who they voted for they always say uh it's a secret ballot so we are not going to talk about it but we we discussed political issues yeah definitely i think i've always been extremely aware of uh caste and i mean it's just because it's so pervasive in 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 andhra pradesh and telangana people talk about it all the time people say you're this you're that so i'm talking to you or i won't talk to you uh i was extremely aware of it i was also e- extremely aware of the privilege that my own family had yeah uh, and, and and not even in terms of money and this is again something that i want to push back against when people say it's just about economic status it's not i mean my my parents didn't have a lot of money when we were growing up we lived in a one bedroom apartment and you know it was a pretty middle class life but there was a lot of privilege because we were educated and we knew people we had contacts any opportunities we needed they were there for us you know these types of things and i i was also acutely aware that some of my friends or people who came from a different background just didn't have that yeah. so i was i i think i was always like very politically conscious that way um i think uh, i really I, my extended family is pretty right wing uh, right now i think a lot a lot a lot, lot of my aunts and uncles are have been extremely brainwashed by the bjp propaganda they are all of us sorry that's all uh, of us yes 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 um uh, they are and you know i've definitely dealt with it and and my family is very close like uh we all, my dad has six siblings and my mom has two siblings and they're all in each other's lives a lot they're extremely oversharing uh, codependent <laughs> family <laughs> and uh, even though my own parents were not super right wing I, i did definitely have to deal with these types of people but i think i've always been a bit of a rebe- rebel and i think him i like you i always talk too much in family gatherings and they were like don't talk when elders are talking and you know um my mom i actually like stop taking me to gatherings she's like you're going to embarrass me <laughs> she's like <laughs> this like a blessing in disguise yeah yeah i was like sometimes um, i remember like i some auntie had said when you're doing your phd you have so much free time so why don't you get married and have a child oh um, wow it's a perfect time to do it and i was like auntie why don't need to get married for this and nice <laughs> my mom just like flipped out she's like how dare you talk like this you know wow well, <laughs> apologize <laughs> you are not coming with me to functions anymore <laughs> but yeah like so i've taken like a pretty like pro uh, so anti nrcca stand in my family and first of all like if you're a woman who takes a political stand they're just like either you are a victim of propaganda or some friend has misled you so basically like all the uncles in my family has taken it upon themselves to educate me <laughs> oh my and god and keep sending me like all of these videos from i don't know who or random like op india and blah 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 all of them and i'm like guys i know what i'm talking about like in my family there i have a male cousin who's an aap supporter and they also keep quarreling like him and all the sanghis keep quarreling but at least he gets like a minimum like minimum respect that he knows what he's talking about i don't even get that they're like this person has she's gone crazy we educate her and bring her on the right path so, <laughs> so all puns intended <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean this is something like literally every sentence that you speak sometimes i feel like they are going to ask you for proof for this every so I, sentence you know yeah i i had this interesting conversation recently i was i was visiting india and uh, we were at this dinner and you know this comes up and somebody is like talking about like how all these people in jnu they're just like full of terrorists and what are they doing there for you know they're like 30 40 years old they just you know stay in the university 
and I was like, I'm 32 years old. I'm a PhD student. Do you think I'm a terrorist? <laughs> and they changed the subject so quickly as if they didn't even hear me. And I was like, but why? Why aren't you like engaging? Like, I'm not. I'm not going into like you know the left ideology or whatever. Like you're just saying you are old and in university, hence terrorist. Like you're not even like listening to like what about the ABVP student who is also in JNU? Like why is he or she not a terrorist? You know, like why they are the same age? They're no different. But somehow they are okay. Yeah, this though is a whole different topic about like how. people like the whole media to play to play gang narrative or whatever but yeah so but like talking about like all the other women in like your family etc like we always observe that you know in family gatherings there's like a men's group to talk about cricket and politics and then there's a women group to talk about marriages and they <laughs> and they, yeah so yes. that's you know that like they that's the thing they expect you to talk about so like how were the women in your family like were they political or even aware as aware as the men or were they allowed to be men my family women yeah. were not political uh-huh. they were not and my mom didn't talk much about politics uh-huh ever um my extended on it's an uncle's like now they are i mean now there are so many whatsapp messages and it's it's in in fact interesting to me because this is the first time i'm i'm even hearing their opinions on <laughs> muslims or demonetization or rahul gandhi yeah. so i i in a way i can't even be surprised because i i'm not really sure what they were thinking before they were very silent at least the women never talked about politics yeah yeah and what about you hardik yeah i don't think they ever talked about anything to do with politics except like i remember this one time my grandmother sort of bragging ke she has fed a lot of rotis to bharose shikhawat uh my my family yeah. actually like my extended family but my mother's side is like so deep into the sung it's like she would like name drop all the time like by one of my mom's uncles was a pracharak with narendra modi and mm-hmm. one of my other uncles went to college with lal ke advani so it was like you know when they were all uh, student politicians it was all like if they were like chaddi buddies apparently and then my great grandfather got to win and they got my uh, grand whatever grand uncles married and then grahasthi you know so <laughs> but uh, uh but no they were all like they were all go to shakhas and and one of my uncles actually does work for bjp uh so yeah i think the women's women's opinions were like never asked and uh, and and i think for me it was not just that you know they were never asked in political decisions but also you know like all my aunts had like degrees uh, they were uh, and stuff so they want like a educated bride but they don't want her to work and there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of that where you know you have to like cover your head with the you know everything so it was very conservative there was never any um, <laughs> like my mom was a very unpopular uh popular and unpopular person because uh, you know she uh, she was the one who like you know went to talk to my uncles when they wouldn't let their like like my cousin like female cousins like go somewhere to study and so in that sense like if if my aunts wanted her help she was popular otherwise you know they were uh they would talk about how she only has like two daughters and that's such a sad thing yeah uh, yes that's that yeah yeah so my dad is a sonologist okay and we are also like two sisters so i have a younger sister so and like in sonography you can like find out what the gender of your child is but mm-hmm. of that's banned everywhere in india so like when my like my younger sister was born there were just people who would come to my dad and be like 
बट यू योर सेल्फ एज आर अनोलॉजिस्ट तो आपको तो पता चल ही गया होगा लड़की है फिर भी यू लाइक लेट हर बी बॉर्न वाई डिड यू डू वाई वुड यू डू दैट T M I, but uh, so my sister when she's younger, and she was a C-section, and um, so my parents had decided that they did not want any other children, and uh, sometimes with C-section they also like will tie the tubes. Tie your tube. Yeah, my yeah. mom got that too. So, 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 so they, they said that uh, yeah, just just do that, please, and and you know my dad was waiting outside. and so my sister so there we didn't have we didn't know sonographer so we didn't know the uh, sex of the child beforehand and my sister was born and it, she was female and so in the middle of the surgery right this this doctor steps out of the operating theater and calls my dad and my dad is freaking out because he thinks something went wrong and then she tells him that it's a girl so are you sure you want to go ahead with the operation or do you want to try one more time and my dad was furious he's like are you fucking kidding me is this why you stopped and came out of the uh, the operating theater to say this and he was just like please finish the operation and that is the level of just the brainwashing that's there in our society that even doctors are afraid absolutely like you indian, know indian gynecologist dude like you can't go to a gynecologist in india as a single woman oh my god yeah, oh, yeah. that should be a separate separate episode I, for sure yes <laughs> i can yeah i can go on and on about that for like hours the only frank conversation like the first frank gynecological conversation i had was when i came to the us because in india you have to tell you have to lie to them <laughs> like yeah i'm asking for a friend <laughs> yeah or uh, i think swati said the other day that the euphemism is are you married oh yeah <laughs> <I'm> mar- <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. yeah and like it like, was because my parents are doctors like yeah. they know all other doctors Mm-hmm. So there's no no such thing as like patient doctor confidentiality yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. what is that <laughs> yeah i was like they'll go tell my parents only so <laughs> so like that is a whole other podcast topic yeah. but but like talking about like women in stem we've talked a lot about like how all most of the men in stem are explicit like bjp right wing supporters what have you guys observed in like your friends who are in engineers or even in um, other fields in stem uh, about their political opinions let's start with hartika you um so uh, you know when i said that i think it's a coin toss about women i say that because i i have a very very close friend who has just gone full full sanghi like it is it hurts me so much uh and it's like like in a way i get it because like you know she grew up in nagpur and so i understand that she had all that you know priming but uh, you know in undergrad like i've seen her read like ramchandra guha she read basically all of ramchandra guha's like pop history books and everything and then you know she went to like a good management school and like i don't know but somewhere along the way she became like such a rabid black person that i was just like i don't understand this at all you know um so i feel like you know there's a there's two two kinds of um, women react to like you know all the attention you get uh, all the microscope attention you get not the good one uh in in iit or or generally engineering with two things one uh, is just like you become you take you know positions of responsibility regardless and one you sort of become quiet you just keep your head down just graduate right uh so the women who do that 
kind of just like continue with that I, at least is a tend to yeah. the ones who uh, are more active in like student organizations and stuff they do tend to become like more vocal more publicly about uh, you know political opinions uh, but it can go either way like i feel like if you've been if you've sort of uh, internalized the broness and then gone to a management school then it is just like you it is i have you like Kima, you are a wonder to me. Like you went to management school and you still did not. I'm just like wow. It's I marginally better know. in the US than in India. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the thing is, yeah, it's the thing with like Indian management schools is it's like all the engineers come there. Yes, it's only engineers. Like that test yeah. is optimized for engineers. Exactly. Out here, एक तो the schools when they're admitting only they have like specific quotas for fields. So like ऐसा नहीं कि सारे technical को ले लेंगे. Yeah, yeah. For sure, for sure. US में it's not this like craziness for engineering. So you have like a decent amount of people from a diff a lot of background. So it's like better than doing management in in India at least. Yeah, no, for sure. That that is definitely true. But I will, yeah, it it is. But I don't know. Like still, like if you go to a a big sort of uh, engineer, like a management school here, you still have that like competitiveness of like, oh, I need to like make more money, and you will like. I don't see uh, people coming out of a management school and then sort of like you know developing a more left wing ideology. If you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. there's definitely like a. a lot most people were right leaning even within the americans and plus like all of the career choices there's investment banking there's consulting both very very cutthroat and like historically there have not been a lot of women in it like especially banking to there have been like legendary stories about how horribly women are were treated and like are still being treated so like Definitely, like hyper competitive and crazy, etc. Like I sort of went into tech, so I avoided much of like all of that craziness. But it's definitely there. Yeah, I think hyper competitive environments are definitely more sexist, and uh, I so I worked a lot with uh, doctors in in my PhD, um, and more than engineering, when I hear stories about. you know that the the kind of stories i've heard uh, i you know a doctor that i know had to hide her pregnancy or she wouldn't get a job and and there is a lot of uh, attrition i mean a, a lot of people start the program and never finish it it's it's extremely competitive extremely uh, aggressive masculine environment And can I just yeah. say there is almost like a pride in the fact that oh, not everybody graduates. You know, we call out the weak, and that that shit is so like I don't know. It gives you the creeps. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand what is. Yeah, like it's it's nothing to be proud of for sure. And you're failing. I mean, also so so this uh, surgeon who who was forced to lie about her pregnancy. And so she told me, like one way that she deals with it is when she has male residents and they have a baby, she forces them to take paternity leave. She is like, "No, your your female uh, colleague is doing it, so you also do it." And that is the only way to kind of equalize it. Is like you force the men to participate yeah. in in domestic activities too. I mean, that's the only way. And I think that's like an interesting strategy. But yeah, it's interesting. But like, yeah, like. I mean, ultimately, like, if you want to make the situation better, like that, men taking up more of the childcare and sort of the, you know, household responsibility is ultimately the only way. Mm-hmm. Like, like, even in India, like they pass this like maternity leave law, which gives six months maternity leave, but it's only women. Like, men right. don't have right. any. So right. it, like it never really changes the problem that women ultimately are stuck with all of the work. Yeah, um, I mean, and pardon me if I'm incorrect, but I thought that was only for women government employees, which is like a statistical error, basically, <laughs> as far as India's population is concerned. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
I mean, I, I I might be incorrect. I don't know, but that was my understanding. Yeah, but I mean, even India is still marginally better than the US. Either to kisi ko bhi nahi there is no. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But and, and even beyond, um, you know, domestic family versus uh, career. I mean, beyond a point, I don't want to go to that topic much more. Yeah. But even person like personality wise like if i am talking to a colleague of mine and we're both at a conference we're both on equal setting i think even then when you talk to them it's just a different interaction like i said like anything that i say uh in an academic environment i feel like they would question it they'd be like what's the proof where's the proof you know show yeah. me a citation or um there there are some cases where i you know i was writing this open source software with an undergrad who was working under me i mean he was like my trainee type of a person and when people came to ask questions about it they would ask him and not me oh wow just That's because like... he was yeah and uh, i mean i don't know if if it's a question of comfort or you just want to talk to a guy or you think you're I I I really don't understand and actually when I was doing my PhD um so we realized that first of all there was no female representation in our department at all uh there were very few uh, women and they were all in different labs uh and we didn't know each other so we started a group or uh, called women of vanderbilt institute of surgery and engineering um and so i was one of the founding members and we started it and then it's and then i slowly found out that it's not just me who experiences these things it's everybody everybody has the same story it's overwhelming i, I mean i it's yeah. it's interesting even in the us did vanderbilt do anything about it though so i think um uh us starting this group was something that they wanted to show ki let's see what we are doing for diversity um but i think so we we did start a lot of programs so one thing is we started a mentorship program where we had women who graduated already from this program or women professors to come talk about their experiences we had coffee talks sometimes we uh, had some events where we invited even um like men yeah. and just open up the discussion and like confront the problems and see what they have to say and that was actually surprisingly they they were receptive to it i mean they i think if you sit down and talk to them and say that boss this is what you're doing they do listen to you most of the time i think a lot of them are just not even aware of their behavior you know and i think the most successful event we had was uh we had a screening of uh, hidden figures and after that i i did this uh short um <coughs> um epilogue of where i gave the statistics of women in in academia how many phd's and so on and and then we had like a discussion it was probably one of the best discussions where like men were finally beginning to see why this is an issue they were talking up and a couple of times some like they see guys in my lab when i said something they were like go shit a hidden figures right and i was like okay this is too much but sure <laughs> some impact <laughs> has happened yeah i mean it's better than like the other way around yeah 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 <laughs> i mean i don't know they might have been mocking but at least they were thinking about these issues a little bit yeah yeah definitely like we did some of that in my business school as well and it it did seem to like open up a lot of people's eyes even in terms of race like which is a big concern mm -hmm. and like a lot of white people and even us um uh, indians were like so completely blind to many of the things that we said and things like that so it was great to have at least have those conversations I mean race is a whole different yeah. issue in the US that yeah. yeah definitely awesome yeah but like you know talking because at least we talk explicitly about race in the US I have also like realized how racist Indians are and mm -hmm. uh, and so that has like you know 
I think that has made my my mom more uncomfortable uh, around me. Where I think, uh, like in from Gujarat, it's it's a there is a direct line of like people like emigrating to Africa to work because oh, yeah. uh, you know uh, they believe that Asians make businesses there believe that Asians mm-hmm. make better managers because they have no problems being cruel to um, <laughs> other people of color. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. So uh, uh, it was, it was really, yeah. It, it was very interesting for me. Like, you know, if I said, like, if I said something, not no. I'm sorry. Um, it, you, like, we went to. We were talking to. We, we were at this dinner, and we were talking to someone, and. Uh, they just made a generic, very racist statement about, like, you know, people they interact with um, in Africa. And, and I don't even remember which city. I'm really sorry. Uh, but, uh, you know, and I just, you know, later I told my mom I thought that was very racist. She just, like, kept silent. Like, she just didn't want to even, like, engage with me about, like, this whole thing that we also need to, like, examine ourselves and, and mm-hmm. see, like, you know, with all our privilege, how we are oppressing other people. Absolutely. I think Indians are just blind to race in general. Like, are they, I mean, Indians here, my cousins, my, I have a lot of uh, family in the US, and some of my cousins have definitely said really racist things and they've been living here for longer than I have some of them have been living here 20 years and they have no awareness of it uh, they they will just say it and sometimes they use like a Hindi word or a Telugu word so you but come on I mean that doesn't make it better that you're not using uh, the word in English right, right. and uh, I, I actually find that uh, that Indian community here can actually be su- super racist, and they seem to have no awareness of the issues at all. And like I think, I think a lot of naturally, them. Sorry, I say I think it yeah. comes naturally to them because they're <laughs> so used to talking like that about with caste that it's like, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course, like you know, everyone is like that. They are lazy, right. you know. Yeah, 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 and like the only time we. Like acknowledge race is when we have to claim that we've been racially discriminated against, but not actually like stand up for people of other races who are not even right. that privileged. Like Indian Americans are pretty privileged. Yeah, I mean, they even, even in about- that, uh, they will like you know be white uh, like apologists. Like I have never faced discrimination. Uh-huh. Like I have, you know, there will be enough apologists even there. Like they will not even acknowledge that uh, we have ever faced anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Really great. I think this was an amazing discussion. I think if we go on talking after this, the three people who have survived till now will also stop listening. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to wind up now. But before we wind up, why don't you guys give us your recommendations? Any books, movies, like podcasts, etc. Um, Hardika? So I am reading this book um, uh, in uh, full disclosure. This was written by a person who taught me at YF. His name is uh, Jonathan Gill Harris. He's written this book called Masala Shakespeare, which I am absolutely in love with because it's it's about like a textual analysis of, uh, you know, um, Bollywood movies and how in a lot of ways they are, you know, they may have the spirit of what, Um, Shakespeare did with like you know mixing languages and you know so yeah it was a a very fun book uh, and it's something I read to like get away from everything that is making me sad so (laughs) that sounds really interesting yeah it's a fun book nice what about you Shikha um so I, I think since we ended on the topic of racism, I um, recently read Americana, oh, wow. which is um, an amazing book. I mean, I wanted to underline every line in that book because even though it's it's from the perspective of a Nigerian um, immigrant, it's it's so similar. I think we have very similar 
uh, backgrounds because they were a colony, we were a colony. It was the same sort of like obsession with English language and this anglicized upbringing. And then you come here and the experiences that you have here as a woman and a woman of color. It was amazing. I loved it. I think it's probably definitely my my f- favorite book. Oh, nice. That I've ever read. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of my favorites as well. It's an amazing. Book. I'm a I'm a Chimamanda fan in general. Like even her TED talk and like she wow. is amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So great. My recommendation is like so. The first one is Home Fire by Camilla Shamsi. Uh, it's like so. It's it's like a retelling <laughs> of the story of Antigone, which is like I think an ancient Greek story, but she's brought it to modern day Britain, and it's about um sort of the islamic identity in the west uh islamophobia and also like how young muslim men are swayed by islamic radicalism etc mm-hmm. so it's it's a really really good book and it won like some award it's won many awards like 2 3 years ago but it's a great book and the second one is a series and it's a really fun series on netflix called derry girls and it's it's about basically four girls in high school in Ireland and it this is this is during the 90s so there's a lot of 90s references and those and it's during like the whole IRA sort of i don't have a lot of knowledge of irish politics but essentially IRA was like very active at the time and so all of that was going on but basically these girls do a ton of crazy things and it's just very very fun so i love watching it so check it out So well with that we wind up the podcast thank you so much Shikha and Hardika for joining us thank you thank you this was really fun it was it yeah. was and we should like do this more and yeah. Yeah. i can't <laughs> wait to be famous <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah people will ask you for autograph so yeah yeah <laughs> great well and thank you everyone for listening uh, we'll join you in another episode soon Thank you. Thank you.